Let us pray. Our Father, we are grateful to you for helping us to be participants in this church growth seminar which is sending this morning. We bless your name for all the things you have taught us. And we pray that as we gather together now and share a little together and bring everything to conclusion, that your hand will grow with us. Amen. Be with us, O oh Lord. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are grateful to the Lord for thus far he has led us, thus far he has given us his word through our state leaders and pastors as well as in all the programs we are partaking of as we have been at the headquarters church in town. We have heard much, and we are reaching much, and we have prayed and consecrated much. I do not intend to keep you for a long time this morning. I only want to tell you that there is no limit to what a man can do if he is indwelt by God. When we want to enter into the ministry of preaching, ministration, bringing the lost to the Lord, in our own human understanding, there is something that is heavy on our hearts, and it is training. Many times we have desired training on an individual basis, either expressed or not expressed, and we have felt within ourselves, privately, if only I could have more training. If there was a school I could attend, and through that school I could get a lot that I'll be able to minister effectively for the glory of God. But we have seen people that have had that desire fulfilled. They've gone for training. Or maybe they have come for training here at the IBTC when we were still operating the IBTC. Yet, they have discovered at the end of the training that it is not what you have. It is who lives in you what you have, the knowledge you have gained, these things are very useful, they are very good. But it is not what you have in the head or in the mind that really makes you successful eventually on the long run. It is who you possess and who possesses you. All our needs are met in Christ. Our needs in ministration will all discover that they are in Christ Jesus. If he lives within us and he is allowed to direct, to control, and to lead and to use us, a lot can be done. At other times, apart from training, we have felt sometimes if only I could be less busy, if I could be allowed to concentrate on things spiritual, uh, I do not get myself involved with things that are physical, like thinking about the church building, thinking, thinking about the administration, thinking about the training of the workers, thinking about all the other things that are just perhaps physical, administrative, or just management um, activities in the church. If I could only have all the time to myself to pray, to plan, to prepare my messages, only preach, 
and let all the other people in the church do the rest of the things. I think I would have been more successful. And there are ministers that have arranged things like that, that they never get involved with anything except preaching and praying in their churches. And yet, they have discovered exactly the same thing as they knew before. No growth. The power of God had not actually uh, moved like they supposed the power of God will move. So they feel, what's the matter? Why is, is it like this? That now the physical had been taken off, the administrative has been taken off, all the things I thought were hindering me, all these things have been taken off, and yet the work is not being done. Then they think of another thing again. Maybe it's this place where I am that actually is hindering me. This is not my place. I am misplaced. If, if I could just pray and I could have the freedom and liberty to be where I know the Spirit wants me, I think I'll be doing well. I'll be doing fine. So he prays. And um, he requires for a change. If he is under a pastor, under a state leader, perhaps the pastor or the state leader condescends and he says, if you feel that's the best for you, and you feel if you're in such a place, you'll be all right. Okay, move there. Then we'll take the person there, we'll bring him to another place. Now he is happy for the first few days, the first few weeks. And he begins to see that uh, this place is harder than where I left. The demons must have known that I really wanted to succeed. And here am I now, before I came, they have come. I think the problem is uh, being in the deeper life system, organization, and system. I'm not free enough. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I know if I could have liberty and just be free. If I want to fast for seven days, I fast. If I want to preach for three hours, I preach. If I want to have a convocation, seminar, um, what else now, crusade, anything I want to have, I have any time. All this going up and down. Saturday, every Saturday, come to the state capital, come to this one, come to Lagos, come to IBTC, come to this. It's, that's the thing that is not making me successful. And I know that, I know what I have, I know what I can do, I know my calling, I know the things that are, if I had the liberty that I could do, I think that if I'm just on my own, nobody watching over me, nobody saying, hey, why did you do this, why didn't you do this, I think I know the answer. I think I can succeed. But um, I must pray before I face that state representative. Because he's going to be asking me a lot of questions. Why are you going? You know, this is a place for you. And the best is that you stay with me. I know all the arguments, all the reasoning they are going to, but he doesn't understand. But there's something within me. That fire, I'm not going to allow anybody to quench it. That power within me, I'm not going to allow anybody to just cover it up in a corner somewhere in a local government area. I am going to do this. I'm going to make up my mind. Whoever I offend, whoever gets disappointed, all these other brothers that will come to talk to me and say, oh, brother, where are you going again? This is our place. This is our ministry. This is our church. I'm just going to make up my mind and determine because if I don't do it, I will not become a Billy Graham. Because if Billy Graham had been under one Baptist church somewhere, directing him, don't go this way, don't go that way, don't go that way. How will he do what he's doing now? I will make it. And so he makes up his mind. And then he goes to state recently and says, excuse me, sir, uh, I want to tell you what God has been, has been telling me. It's, I resisted it. I rejected it. I said, no. And we're all here together now. <laughs> I cannot do this. And God said, I must do it. I pleaded with God. And I told God, oh God, I know what you've been telling me. I respect my state representative. I love him. He's like my real father in the Lord. But the, the pressure was too much for me. I said, you will be praying for me. You are still my father. Any problem I have, I will still come back to you. 
But uh, God is telling me, and he has been, in fact, I could not eat. I could not sleep until I told God that God, I will obey you. And he said, I said, what's the matter? What is it now? Is it married? Ah, my, what am I doing with married? <laughs> what is it now? And uh, it's, uh, God has been telling me to, to live uh, the deeper life. All that we do in deeper life, I agree. In fact, I don't understand why God is telling me like this. But I've resisted it long, long enough. And eventually, it was when I said, Oh God, thy will be done. I had peace. And when I decided I will come to you, in fact, the prayer I prayed, because the way you love me, the way you've been taking care of me in this ministry, I, of all the pastors and of all our workers, I know how you take me. And yet, when God began to deal with me like this, what will I do now? So, uh, my leader, you are still my leader. Anywhere I go, if I go Holland, if I go Jamaica, if I go uh, anywhere, you are still my leader. Please be praying for me. Any problem I have, you are still my counselor. Who do I have? All these all over Nigeria, all these other evangelists who are wasting their time. I respect this deeper life so much. If it's not for God that is telling me just to live like this. Thank you, sir. I know you, I know you want me to do the will of God. Is that no so, sir? <laughs> and eventually, uh, he says, okay, the will of the Lord be done. And then uh, you go. Uh, how about uh, the location uh, where you were before? Well, uh, if you want another person to take over, or if you want me to even start there and just change the signboard, since it's the same gospel, <laughs> No, Lagos will not allow that for me. Uh, just say, uh, you can live there. Where are you going to be now? I'm still praying. I'm still finding out this. Because God has been, just a step at a time, God has been leading me. And that is how I've been. Like I came here today now, for me, I will not, it's, I woke up this and God said, today is the time. This is the day of action. Go to the state leader now. That's why I came today. I, since God began to deal with me, I just listen to God and I obey God. Okay, then he goes. Now he has established. For the first few days, he is happy. God, he delivered me from the yoke of deeper life. The rope, they tied in my leg. <laughs> Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. You caught that rope. God, this is the greatest thing you have done for me in my life. I thank you. And he begins to pray. And then all these the primary school children, ten of them, they came. And all the old uh, women carrying cassava from farm, five of them, they came. Oh, he's saying, I will soon have the breakthrough. That is how the fan life itself started. They started with 15 people. These five cassava women, they are enough for me at the beginning. And all these five, uh, 10 secondary uh, primary school children will start there. And then, after uh, five months, no more than 16 people. After one year, he prays, he fasts, then some of these familiar spirit uh, ladies, they come, they sing chorus, they pray. And then there are people that come to say, Pastor, how are you? Washing pastor's clothes. There is liberty, all that uh, deeper life uh, restriction. Women must not come and wash your clothes. Women must not come and cook for you. Women must not come and do this. Keep up, women, women, women. There is liberty. Who was uh, watching after Peter like that? Or Paul like that? And they begin to wash his clothes. They cook for him. Thank God now. I'm a GS myself. <laughs> <laughs> and they become a GS over 20 people. <laughs> and uh, he continues like that. Then he begins to commit adultery. Fasting, he cannot fast anymore. Prayer, he cannot pray anymore. And he's still managing. No, I will not. I will not allow them to think that they have made a mistake. God will forgive anything that a man does. God will forgive. David committed adultery. God forgave. Solomon was a king. Everybody has his own weakness. This is my weakness. God will help me. He patches up. Then eventually, one of those girls became pregnant without any waiting for, without even remembering to carry his next Bible, 
He ran away to he ran, he ran away to another state. And he's hiding himself there. Everywhere when he goes to market in that far away place that he goes, if he sees anybody from that village, he'll be want have they had that information? Have they known I'm the owner of that pregnancy? He ruins his life. It is not what you need is to be indwelt by God. It's not the liberty you think you need. It is not, uh, you know, if I go for training in Bible school, if I move from this location to this location, if I live a deeper life, if I leave this uh, stage, if I cross over from one state to another, that's not the answer. That's not the solution. The thing is being dwelt by God. And when you are indwelt by God, anywhere you are, the power of the Lord within you will work mightily through you. And I believe all these things you have had all through this week, you have not had them for nothing. It is going to bear fruit. Amen. And you will succeed in Jesus' name. Amen. We know that when we are born again, Christ enters into us. Then he says, if we love him, I and my father will come, will make our abode in you. Then when we have the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost himself also comes into us. So then, at that level, we are indwelt by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But then you begin to wonder if I possess God, if I have God, that other minister possesses God. God lives within him. Why is it there is a difference between myself and himself, my ministry and his ministry? Here is the point where you, as a minister of the gospel, as a pastor, here is the point you need to really settle down and say, I know I'm saved. I know I'm sanctified. I know I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. Christ is on the inside of me. God is on the inside of me. But why is it I have not made the much success I ought to make? Now, when you are thinking about something like this, and you want to let the power of God that possesses you, you want to let that power come out and really work effectively and in a dynamic way in your life. It's not a matter for emotion or for feeling or for jumping or for crying. Sometimes I even wonder when you pray here, yeah, when you are supposed to be a pastor, each of you, over a congregation, and then the minister here has finished uh, preaching. And then you start praying. The way some of you pray, I wonder what type of example that is for the church. Because you know, after we are finished preaching, and you are, you are praying, and all you pray is you just cry. You don't say anything. You are just saying, hey, 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 for maybe 30 minutes like that. I wonder what type of example that will be to your congregation. You know, Moses prayed. And when he prayed, the whole of Israel, millions of them, they knew that is a leader praying. It was different. When Joshua prayed, and he stood right in front of that uh, crowd or the army of Israel wanting to finish that battle and he just stood right there and he prayed and he talked to the son they knew a leader was praying when a leader talks to God you know that it's not a childish person who has not been familiar with the courts of heaven and with the processes or the procedure of getting requests answered from above. A person who is a leader is a leader. Whether he is praying 
Whatever he's doing, he's, he's always a leader. He's in authority. But you know, when you are a leader and you go back to the church now, to your congregation, and if you pray like that, how will the people pray? Jesus was somewhere praying. His disciples, they watched him. They are watching you when you pray. When he finished, he said, Jesus, teach us how to pray as John the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray. Because they knew there was a difference. And so, when we finish this now, on the God indwelt man, it's not a time to, you know, just rise up and cry, cry. You know, if you cry, it's not a crime if you cry. There are times that we need to cry. I mean, if you know that something happened uh, in your congregation, like somebody very dear to you in the congregation died, you won't, you won't be jumping and happy. You won't be clapping your hand. You'll be sorrowful. And when you are talking to God about it, you might cry. And uh, even though we talk about the joy of the Lord, we talk about being happy and merry and shouting and clapping our hands on a miracle day, if I went for a funeral service, I won't clap my hand. I won't be jumping up and shouting and saying, praise the Lord. No, in a funeral service, I won't do that. And you know, the life of a pastor is a mixed type of life. You know, sometimes he's rejoicing with a barren woman who has been barren for seven years. Now she's having a child. Sometimes uh, he's happy because of this um, student who has now got uh, um, admission to a higher institution. Sometimes uh, this businessman who has been you know, down all the time, the Lord has blessed him now after you have prayed and he's now coming with a testimony, the Lord has prospered me. Sometimes uh, this person that uh, was rejected and uh, everybody felt he will die. You have prayed for him and now he is well. You are joyful. But sometimes uh, a mother at childbirth maybe loses a child. You don't understand why. But this is still bad. The child has been born but dead. Now a pastor like that, you'll not be jumping and singing and shouting, saying, oh, it's all right, and laughing. They will feel that you are not a human being. There are times in our congregation we need to sympathize with the people. We need to just stay around them and encourage them and weep with them. The sorrowful with them, but there are other times we're also rejoicing. So it's not every time that we are all the time on our feet, shouting and clapping and singing and rejoicing. As pastors, we are fathers over hundreds and thousands of people. And these hundreds and thousands of people, they pass through different stages in life. And that's why the life of a pastor is uh, very deep and it's not something that you can just make up. But then, as we finish here today now, and I talk to you about the God indwelt man, it's not even a message for, you know, jumping and saying, oh yes, uh, you know, had that message, we're going out and we're going to tell the devil off and the devil is in trouble. You know, there are times we've had messages like this and we can, you know, talk on the faith level and just on the faith level, we said, I can do it. I can do it. And you don't know what it takes to maintain the presence and the power of God within you. And that's what I'm concerned about this morning. It's something you'll think about, you'll meditate on, and you will plan on and see what to do about it. I asked a question before. Why is it that if I have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit within me. That other man has the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit within him. Yet I discover that he is wise, I am not wise. And yet the person of the personality, the divine personality supplying that wisdom to him, he lives inside me. Why is it I do not have the wisdom that he has? Why is it if he prays, his prayer is answered, mine is delayed, and yet the power that energizes his prayer within him, I have that same thing 
or personality within me. And yet, its result is higher, greater than my result. Now, I discovered that when that other man, when he's going to take a decision on church growth, taking a decision on the life of man, maybe something happening to an individual, the way he manifests wisdom and the way he approaches the whole problem looks totally different. And I'll begin to say, ah, where did this man learn this thing? Whereas, when I am asked a question, or when I want to take a decision, or when I have something perplexing me, troubling me, I'm not able to know how to, what to say, what to do. And Jesus gave all of us the same promise, that when they bring you before the council, before the governors, don't even premeditate what you are going to say. The spirit of your father within you will speak through you. And yet, I have what he has, and yet I am not having the same result as he's having. Why is it like that? That's the problem we want to solve. And as we're solving that problem, uh, you will need to really pay attention and say, Oh Lord, help me through. Because if you can catch this, and God lives on the inside of you, and he manifests his power from the inside of you, much can be done, and much will be done in Jesus' name. Now, uh, in Lagos here, we thank the Lord for what he has been doing. But if I happen to be the only one that God can use, even in Lagos, and all the other people in Lagos cannot discover what to do to be as effective as I am. Well, there may be some variations or little, little differences. But when you think about it in a major way, you're thinking of the central thing. You're not talking about the variations. My use of language will be different from another man's use of language. My voice will be different from another person's voice. My way of approach may be different from another man's uh, approach. But when you think about the final outcome, about the real thing, and you're thinking about effectiveness, and the congregation, you know, they're saying, well, they thank God. Even though Moses is different from Joshua, they thank God because the same spirit of wisdom in Moses is the same spirit of wisdom in Joshua. You know, when you get to that level, we're happy. And if I were the only one that could discover how God can move this way and move that way, that is not the best for the church. It's not the best for any group of people. The same thing for uh, our state. If in our state uh, we cannot reproduce what God is doing in Lagos, not copying, no. Volkswagen doesn't have to copy Peugeot, uh, com uh, Peugeot Company. But they have discovered similar things. Even though the make of car with uh, Volkswagen is different from the make of car with uh, Peugeot vehicles, different from Mercedes, you have all these different companies working on these different uh, vehicles. But they have discovered the same principles, the same knowledge, even though the variations are still there. Are you following what I'm saying? But at least they can make their vehicles there, market their vehicles, and the vehicles will still perform to the level they want the vehicles to perform, even though they are handled by different, different people. Now, when we train people in our educational system, and you go to Amadou Bello University, or you go to University of Lagos, or you go to uh, Ibadan uh, University, or you go to um, Unsuka, anywhere you go, if you come out as an engineer, even though there will be differences depending on where you have been trained, but there's still a basic type of performance and knowledge that the people project. And therefore, they still have a measure of success. Are you following what I'm saying? So, and it, it ought to be the same thing. Um, there is a minister who always says, all truth is parallel. What he means by that is that the people of the world have discovered the physical laws and they have put the physical laws to use. 
because of their discovery and their wisdom in putting the physical laws to use, they are successful in the physical realm. He says, if all truth is parallel, the church too can discover the spiritual laws. And if you discover those spiritual laws, then you can also make it and bring it to use. Now you see, Britain does not have to depend on America in the use of the physical laws. Russia does not have to depend on Germany on the use of the physical laws. Even the developing nations in the third world, they are seeing how they can use the physical laws on their own. They do not accept today that the black man is an inferior man. They believe that if even the black men in the third world can discover the same laws and train their own people, they too can do as much as these other people are doing. Now, truth is parallel, according to, you know, that means I told you about now. That means if the church too, whether the church is in Bendel State or Anambra State or Quara State or Kaduna State or Sokoto State, if we can discover how Moses or Joshua or Elijah or Elisha or Daniel or Peter or Paul. Now, when we mention Jesus, in our mind, we say, well, that's Jesus. He is the very Son of God. He didn't have to learn all these things, but he needed to. But we have mentioned all these people so that we will know, as day one, we have been. They were born as babies. They grew up. Somebody must have started telling them one day about the Lord. They responded. They grew they made their mistakes, some things that were very, very foolish that some of these people did when they were growing. Then, one day, they had a breakthrough. From the point of that breakthrough, they went on, and then their life stories that we have been reading, after that breakthrough, we have seen it's so much above the human level, our level, that we feel it's impossible for us. But why? Because... Before that breakthrough, they were as weak as we were. They were as foolish as we were. And they were as ineffective as we were. It was, if you, if you look at the lives of all those men in the Bible that have done anything significant for God in the Bible, there was a time they had a breakthrough. It may be on a day when they have been going on religiously and God just called their name and said, Moses, Moses. And he responded, here am I. And from that day, that man had a breakthrough. Now, look, that's not special. There are people who have had their names called by God, and they didn't follow it through, follow it up. They didn't have a breakthrough. Or it may be that it is just like Joshua, that God will command Moses, lay your hands on him, that he might have the spirit of wisdom. He did. He had his breakthrough. But that's not unusual. That's not something... That is, you know, so special. There are people that have had hands laid upon them. And yet, they didn't know how to put uh, themselves in the line, in the flow of the power and the spirit of God. So it is not just that if I got in Moses, there are people who have had hands laid on them. And yet, they didn't have their breakthrough. Or it may be like Elisha, following after Elijah. Now, People have talked about, uh, you know, Elijah and Elisha. God told Elijah, now, you can die yet now, but you appoint and anoint Elisha and also Jehu. Now, the time of Elisha came, and Elisha kept on following him, kept on following him, kept on following him. God has sent me here, I'll follow you. God has sent me here, I'll follow you. God has sent me here, I'll follow you. Eventually, Ask what you want, what I'll do for you. Give me a double portion of thy spirit. Well, you know the story. You have asked a hard thing. But if you see me, what you see is what you will get. And then he saw him. He said, my father, my father, you know the story. The mantle fell. He took that mantle and then he smote the waters. The waters parted. And from that time, the breakthrough in his own life started. But that's not unusual. 
there have been people that were read about among um, you know the worthies of old I mean when the Pentecostal movement really started and this charismatic charismatic move really started there have been people that were read about who have followed very very closely very very closely if you have read about you know the revivals of the turn of the century and yet even though they have followed very very closely and uh, they appeared for a moment to have received the mantle and in fact um, around some of those people who they would say the mantle of uh, reverend so and so or brother so and so has fallen on such and such but they did not carry on with the breakthrough i'm telling you this so that you will know the lord wants to deal with every one of us and in fact you know some people feel that maybe if i do this there is no rule in a way as to getting through to the breakthrough uh, there are people who have said well if i just come fast i will not take anything from fasting that is i will not uh, depreciate or discourage you from fasting when you need to but let me tell you uh, it's not for everybody like that god will deal with you as he wants to deal with you you know in the ministry of uh, moses after god had called him he fasted 40 days two times he writes in his after the lord had called him called his name but after god appeared to joshua and said moses my servant is dead arise you lead these people after that point and god told him in joshua chapter 3 I myself have called you. I will magnify you before these people. I'll do it myself. You don't just do what I tell you to do. Obey me. Meditate on my word. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Be courageous. Have I not commanded you? Do it. Leave the rest to me. I will magnify you before the people. You know, after that, there was no case when Joshua fasted for 40 days. And yet the breakthrough remained with him. I'm telling you this so that you will know, what will I do? Okay, I will go and do this. You may do it and the breakthrough may not come. If all those things may not even be necessary at all for the breakthrough, it may just be that the Lord wants to get your attention and he wants to speak to you and he say, just follow me and be humble. And I know the desires of your heart. I have called you. As I have called uh, your leader in Lagos, I have called you. Your leader in Lagos is not going to come to your local government area and do what I want done. I have a will. I have a plan for this local government area and you are my man for that place. As I was with Moses, with Joshua, I will be with you because this is your place. Now look, God is not taking me as a favorite as if he's going to do with me what he cannot do with any other person because there's nothing I have which I have given to him. He has given me a place to minister and if I'm faithful in that place, he'll continue. But the place he has given you, he has not given me. I cannot usurp your authority. I cannot take your place. And you are as important to God as I am, where you are. It is true that, you know, there is leadership. That, uh, you know, I'm your leader. But when you think about it, oh, that's a little thing. If you say yes sir, to me, what does that matter to God? If I have to put out nine in your hand, what does that matter to God? All that is just, you know, that's just administration. That's, you know, all the things we do. For, to just to keep things going. Somebody will have to do that. Are you understanding what I'm saying? I mean, they call somebody GS, but when you really think about it, in real understanding of real church work, you just have to call somebody that name. But when you really come to think about who you are, what God has called you to do, and that God has placed you in this particular place, God is interested in you. He is interested that you succeed. Because Jesus died for all the people in that place, and he will use you in your own capacity as much as he's using me. Now, when I say as much as he's using me, you have to believe God. Because God is not limiting his power. You know how many people we got, we had, uh, you were there yesterday for even Bible study. Just Bible study for the first session. And uh, you'll see people that were outside. Well, we didn't start that way. But you've seen it. 
Why did God bring you to see? Why did God bring Abraham out and said, look at the stars? Now, listen to me. Everybody sees the stars. But they think nothing about it when they see. But when Abraham saw the stars, after God told him, after God talked to him, every time he looked up and he saw the stars, something rose up within him. He thought about it. But all people in the world, they go out at night, they see the stars, they never think about it. You have gone there. Not there were other people that were there yesterday. God bless them, but they are not pastors. They saw the stars. They never thought about it. You have gone there, you've seen the stars. And God is talking to you. Have you seen that? There's nothing special in this one. It's not only Lagos. It's not only Brother Kumui. It's not only Jesus. You have seen it. Have it in your mind. That vision you have seen, you will see it in another place. Amen. You see, when you understand it like that, that God brought you here to see and to possess, you will not think that, you know, somebody is special, that other person is special. No, not at all. God wants to have a breakthrough with each of us. Now what's my job? If uh, I'm able to pray for the sick and they recover. And far north, uh, Kaduna or Kano or Sokoto, our leaders there are not able to pray with the same effectiveness and heal the sick. Uh, what's the, what will be my joy? What will be the joy of Jesus Christ if uh, you know, he was able to heal the sick cast out devils, and those wonderful things happened. And after he went away, you know, all the disciples in Jerusalem, in Samaria, they couldn't do anything. But do you know that in the Acts of the Apostles, all that time that Jesus had gone away, the disciples never, after the day of Pentecost, they never regretted, oh, if Jesus were here. Never. Because the same things were taking place. The same effectiveness, the same breakthrough, and the same power was manifested through them. And that is the reason uh, you are here. And that's why I told you, it's not a time for, you know, jumping and saying, oh God, oh God, no. In fact, you know, I discovered that, uh, I've told you, don't copy anybody. Now, there are things that will tell you that you can't copy. You know, you can't lie down now and say, Samuel heard the voice uh, while he was sleeping at night. And Samuel, Samuel, and then he rose up Then His breakthrough came. Well, Samuel wasn't trying to copy anybody. Because Moses was not sleepy when God called his name. If you look at all those men, the way God dealt with them, they were different, one to the other. So you cannot go back uh, now and uh, sleep. You say, well, I will not uh, preach until I have that experience of Samuel. And then you... You sleep at night, you are lying down, you are saying, hey, God is going to call me. God is going to call me. And then all through, you didn't sleep. You were half awake. You are saying, God, call me now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't work like that. You see, the mistake in the Christian church is that unnecessarily, we just copy other people. And God is saying, oh, if you are not uh, a clay or mud copy or plasticine copy of that other man, I could have spoken to you directly. God wants to deal with us. But we cannot, uh, we cannot predetermine. In fact, all those people that talked to you about, they never knew the day the breakthrough will come. That's why we told them on Sunday that because they never know the day the breakthrough will come. Every time you wake up in the morning, you just tell yourself, this day I'll be my best for God. Because I don't know. This day might bring me to the discovery of something, of the breakthrough that will give me the things I've been expecting in my ministry. Because you don't know which day he will come like that. That's why you are prepared all the time. You are looking up to the Lord all the time. You are in the path of duty all the time. Now, uh, I've said all this to tell you that we're not copying anybody. We're preaching the same gospel, the same message, but not that I'm going to fast for 40 days. I've never done that. 
I don't have to. If God wants me to, he will tell me, and then he will give me the strength to be able to do that. But don't think that you have to fast for 40 days. Don't think that you have to. Well, there are some ministers, and I've listened to them. They say that Paul said, I speak in tongues more than ye all. And they don't have time to read Bible. They don't have time to do anything. They said, if Paul said, I speak in tongues more than ye all, he must have spoken in tongues all the time. And so when they come to have their quiet time, they speak in tongues for two hours, and they read the Bible for ten minutes. Now, if that is how they have their breakthrough, God bless them. I don't do it like that, personally. Because the Lord has not led me that way. I don't believe that I have to speak in tongues for two hours and read my Bible for only ten minutes. If I do that, I will not have a message to preach. I will not be able to really get before that congregation and give them real food. In fact, you know, when I go to the congregation to preach, I have so much that... Uh, sometimes the head usher will have to be telling me that, excuse me, sir, whenever you keep late, we have a transport difficulty and traffic jam. I will say, next Sunday, I will improve. But I'm sorry about it. And during the week when I'm preparing, and uh, I don't want to go into details of how, uh, you know, the messages come. Now, I discovered that before that Sunday, I thought I had a long message the previous Sunday. I had to be saying, God, now help me, because I'm in between two. Uh, two. The message is there. The congregation is there. They're happy. They say, preach on preacher. And then I remember my head usher is waiting for me, saying, I hope you'll stop in time today. <laughs> you know. But you know, um, if I just spend all my time speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues alone, and I don't study the Bible, read the Bible, I won't be able to, you know, feed the people and get the work done that ought to be done. Just uh, as we're teaching you, let the word of God soak into your heart. And what the Lord wants you to be, he'll make you to be that way in Jesus' name. Uh, now, I've told you about how these people had breakthrough. But before I read my passages that I've written down before, I didn't plan to say all these things I'm telling you now. But since the Lord wants uh, us to say these things, I think it's better we say them. You think it's all right? Yes. Now, when you check up in the lives of all these people, uh, Moses, Joshua, and the people that we have seen in the New Testament, uh, Elijah, Elisha, Daniel and uh, those of the New Testament. Now, again, what I'm telling you, receive them as adults, as matured people. Don't just go and do anything mechanically. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, when God met with these people, they knew the Lord had met with them. They knew the Lord had given them a particular promise. It's different from when we go to the Bible now and we just check all these promises and we read them. But they knew that particularly the Lord had given them the promise and they stood on that promise for a lifetime. Our problem sometimes is we come to a meeting like this God give us, gives us a promise. He deals with us in a direct way, in a definite manner, and you know it. He has given you that promise. It was so deep on your heart. You were so sure about it, more than even when you were saved. The assurance, the confidence, you held on to that promise. You were very, very happy. And uh, for that week, you were almost walking on the air. Uh, am I, you are following what I'm saying? It was so real. It was so definite. And you appear to have more power than you had before. No, not that you had more power. The power was inside you. Christ was on the inside of you. The promise became life to the one that was on the inside of you. And that made the mighty one on the inside of you. Because that promise is the word of God. And it is spirit, it is life. It made you to feel as if it made the one on the inside more powerful. But no, he had been there all the time. That thing just woke him up. Now, but then you are like that for one week. 
or sometimes like that because you are also waiting upon the Lord you are praying you are looking up to the Lord now when you do that you continue like that and the power is there that time you watch what you say not because of holiness in particular you watch what you say because the Lord is communing with you you don't want to break that communication or that relationship and you're all the time with him if you want to deal with anybody you are very careful no, you are not thinking about if I do this and go to hell. That was not in your mind. It's just that the power of God within you, the relationship between you and the Lord, and also this part that has just risen up like this, you say, ah, this is so wonderful. Even your friends, you still have friends, but you don't, uh, you are thirsty for prayer. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, there are times when, if you have to pray, you just determine you are going to pray. There are times like that. But this time, you are thirsty for prayer. You are thirsty to talk to God again. It looks like the moment you enter your house like this, that time you enter and you see that open Bible on the table and you just see a particular thing, the Lord just reminds you, and without even kneeling down, without even saying anything, you just lock your door, you are praying immediately. And immediately you start that praying, not like you prayed before and you you know you'll pray and pray and pray and after 30 minutes you travel a long distance before you get to the throne of grace but this time the moment you just close your door like this and open your mouth you are before the throne of grace i mean you are, it's just natural it's flowing you are thirsty for prayer that's the way i can put it are you following what i'm saying now you may go on like that and that same promise you're not even looking for a new promise that thing that God told you two weeks ago, three weeks ago, it is still the same thing you just remind God. And when you remind God like that, it looks like they put a springboard within you. The moment you just put your, uh, repeat that promise of God that he gave you three weeks ago, like a springboard, you just get into his presence and you continue like that. That time, you are not even thinking of devil, temptation, sin, anything. And you are not thinking about even healing the sick, casting out devils. It appears back, back in your mind. You don't, it, like a spiritual intuition. You just know that if I pray for the sick, they'll recover. You won't know how you knew. You just know. That's already the gift of faith. You may not even call it any name. You may not say this is the gift of faith, but you just know that you know that if I pray for the sick, they'll recover. And you are not trying to. You are not endeavoring to manifest power. You are not deliberately saying, I will do this. That trying and struggling, saying, I will pray for the sake, I will do this, I'll cast out devil. You are past the stage of trying. It is just that this is just normal with you now. You are following what I'm saying? Now, it may continue like that for about uh, one month. Then you discover that maybe some of your friends, they have discovered that you, a little bit, not that you are bad, not that you are not talking, not, you still talk to people and you are still free with people, but there is a difference. Because now the, that prayer is already becoming something like spring water coming out of a place that you can't stop. And because of that, your life has changed a little. You were saved and sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost before, but things are now different. Because of that, your friends will want to recover you because they are losing you. And so they will say, ah, bro, What's the matter with you? Let's be careful though, because you know, uh, we need fellowship, we need this, we need this. Oh, you say, but there's nothing now, because in fact, that time, you love everybody more than you love anybody before. You, because you just don't know the nature of God, even though you were sanctified before. Now, this is not, um, you know, the uh, first work of grace, second work of grace, third work of grace. You are passed beyond work of grace. You know, it, this is no more arithmetic saying I, my, I got saved step number one, I got sanctified step number two, I got baptized in Logo step number three you, even though those are steps I mean I'm not uh, cancelling those things but the way you have been with God you have stopped counting steps you have stopped counting that uh, experience number one, experience number two experience number three, you are just in the presence of God and in the presence of God anything can happen anytime and this time you love everybody more than you ever loved anybody before and yet your friends want to recover you now they'll begin to talk to you say ah, ah, what's the matter now? look at how you are behaving look at how you are doing this look at how you are doing this now if you didn't look ahead to that before 
you will not know how to handle it. Therefore, before you ever get into that situation that they will think they want to recover you, you ought to have made your life uh, good enough that you deliberately you are still near to those your friends. Deliberately. Because you know, if you are not, they will come. If you don't go to them, they will come to you. So deliberately, you will not just be like the people who just pray, pray, pray and pray and you say I'm thirsty for prayer, I'm thirsty for this. You'll make an allowance. And you already you will you know have that link and relationship so they won't bother you they won't take it away from you if you're a married man when you are like that because listen there are times when you when you really come into that breakthrough into the flow of the stream of the power of god like that and god has given you a breakthrough now anytime you're coming you like to pray you like to and sometimes uh, you are sleeping at night I said sometimes, don't copy anything. If God wants to do anything with you, let him do it his own way. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't say, uh, since uh, it has happened to this brother talking to us like this, now I'm also going to go out and do this. No, let God, if God is doing it, it will be natural. If God is doing it, it will be powerful. And it will have that mark of made in heaven. It will not have a mark of made in Nigeria, made at Ayobo. <laughs> you, know? you know, if it is God, his stamp of approval will be there. Do you understand what I'm saying? So there are times that it may be that at night, the Lord is just giving you a song, not a song for the congregation. You know, sometimes that's when you are, it's good that somebody has made the mistake. And then uh, you are now being told about the mistake. Then you'll be able to say, oh, thank God, I will not make that mistake. You know, sometimes when God deals with you at night in a dream, or maybe you don't even know whether it's a dream or not. You just don't. And when the people in the Bible, when they don't know whether it's a dream or not, they say in a night vision. They can't tell you whether they are awake or they are asleep, or they are in their room, or they are in their chamber, or they are by a stream, or anywhere they just say night vision. There are times that God will just give you the breakthrough. And he comes to meet you, you know, he comes to talk to you at night, and he gave you such a chorus, you've never heard it before, of such great power. And you sang, and the power was so much, and then after you wake up, you make a mistake. You want to remember that chorus to go and teach the church. And God didn't give it to the church. And because of that, God wipes it off your brain. You still remember the enjoyment of it. You can still visualize and picture. And you can, if you want to be in that environment spiritually, you can still be still and be in that environment, but the last thing that will come is that same thing. Because you have a purpose. You are saying, oh, if I can just remember this thing, it's such a beautiful chorus, I will teach it tonight. And God didn't give it for that purpose, and everything is blank. Because of that, because you do not have what you want to remember it and go and teach it at the congregation, you are disappointed. You wash it up. You say, I thought there was something to it. I didn't know. Well, since I've forgotten it, it's a pity. Do you remember where Solomon had his breakthrough? In a dream? And God came to him in a dream and said, Solomon, ask me what you want. Now, God doesn't deal with, God didn't deal with Moses that way. He didn't deal with uh, Joshua that way in a dream. He did not deal with, uh, you know, all these others who are talked about like that. But... You don't try to do anything. You don't try to make up anything. God can deal with his own children, his own servants, the workers, the pastors, in any way. Now he went to Solomon like that and communicated with him. And when he did, now Solomon woke up. He didn't feel that well. Now that I've got that in my dream, let me now listen. Let me now pray in reality and make it a reality. You know, many of us, we do not believe the dreams. 
Now, not that we don't believe that God speaks in dreams. We do not believe that if God says anything in the dream, and you received anything in the dream, and anything really happened in the dream, that if you don't wake up now to make it a reality, that will ever be a reality. There are people like that. And we are in that position because we have taught the people, and it is true, by and large, that some people say they get saved in a dream. You know, you never get saved in a dream. You must repent. That is true. A sound doctrine. But after you are saved, after you are sanctified, after you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, God can do anything, anytime, whether you are awake or you are asleep. But don't try to copy anything. In fact, you know, if you know anything about God at all, it is uh, when you try to dream, you never dream. <laughs> are you, are you, you understand that? You know, somebody who didn't believe speaking in tongues went to a brother and said, do you speak in tongues? He said, yes, I speak in tongues. He said, speak in tongues for me. <laughs> it's a doubter. So the other brother with the wisdom of God uh, looked at him and said, before I do what you want me to do, do you ever dream? And he said, yes, dream a dream for me. <laughs> you know, you never can do it. You cannot dream a dream for me. Now you see, when you make up your mind and you say, oh God appeared to Solomon in a dream, I'm going to dream a dream. It is then a dream never comes. Let God do it in his own way. You just yield yourself to God. Now come back. I've told you. When God is dealing with you like this, if you're a married man, if you're not careful, you will just be in your chamber and you will pray and pray and pray and you're having a breakthrough. You may even say, well, you want to do without food, you want to fast, you want to do this, you want to do that. Now, if you didn't make enough uh, preparation, you have a wife. That wife has a Bible. That wife knows all that the Bible teaches on marriage. Knows about the relationship, about the fellowship, about communication, about, you know, helping one another. And if you are not sharp, and understanding and do your duty you are going to just make your wife to be apart you know because you are having uh, intimacy with God and now you don't want to have uh, any disturbance at all and if you happen to have children and your wife is going to just be taking care of the children alone and uh, eventually after three days or four days your, your wife is going to say bro we have something to discuss on because uh, this new system, we must discuss it. <laughs> because uh, this uh, boy, our second child, was crying, 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 and crying yesterday. And I, was, I went to the market. And you heard the cry of this child. And you locked your door. We have to talk about this thing. You see, you didn't make good preparation before. Because of that, if you say, no, I'm sorry, look, when you become, if you get bitter and you say, I know you are going to disturb me. All these uh, pastors, uh, growth, grow, church growth, uh, seminar special that we went for, I know that you don't want me to keep the blessing. <laughs> then you are going to talk and talk. The moment you get bitterness against your wife, at that moment, even you yourself, you will know. It's like the, you are reading a thermometer and it's at 70 degrees. It will come to a sharp drop of, it, of uh, 30 degrees. And you will know it because if you have been going on with the Lord like that and you are at that level, when there is a sharp drop, just suddenly you will know there's a sharp drop. If you are not careful, when you notice that, that uh, there's something that has happened within, you'll become unhappy again. You'll say this woman. No matter what's my goal, no matter what's my purpose in life, you will not allow me to get up in life. And the things I want to do, you will never allow this thing to be possible. Okay. What do you want me to do? You want me to be babysitting for you, taking care of you. Okay, bring the children. Bring the... Uh, Samuel, no. <laughs> <laughs> your mother says I am the one that should be changing your diapers. Okay, sit down here. I'm married, I'm married. There's nothing I can do, <laughs> you know. It dropped to 30, 30 degrees before, it will come to 10 degrees. 
and you know you'll be unhappy you'll be bitter you'll be you'll be hard on your wife everything will just go wrong and before you can come back to that same level again and it is because you didn't make preparation but you know look uh, i have passed through these things as an adult but i do not allow things to get to that stage i go to god and i tell god now god I know that Moses, when you gave him a breakthrough, he still had to do other things that he needed to do. He needed to find out that manna is there all the time. He needed to find out that this is going on. He needed to think about the building of the tabernacle. He needed to think about, you know, even Aaron. And, you know, when they committed the adultery or something, he needed to still get involved. I know that, Lord, I'm not going to just stay inside the chamber and inside the room like this and only pray, 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 and pray. Even though I love praying now, I still have to deal with this and deal with this and deal with this. I tell God. And then my family is there. This is there. And then, uh, before my wife would even notice that I am, you know, going on anything special or something, I would already, you know, ask questions, discuss with her. But because I, I know that I want to be in a place, in my room, in my chamber for something, since I'm the one that started the discussion, I can time the discussion. But she won't know that I can time that discussion. If she started it, I cannot time it. Because she has something in mind she wants to say. And if, if I'm in a hurry, she knows. And when you are in a hurry, you spend more time than when you are not in a hurry. <laughs> because the moment your wife knows that you are saying, now, you know, I'm growth conscious. I want this church to become 5,000 in only two months. Therefore, this thing we are discussing, uh, you know, let's finish it in 10 minutes. When she knows you are in a hurry like that, then she branches off and begins to complain. You never gave me you never gave me time before and you know that i'm helping you if i married another person i'm telling you it will not be like this now this is not the thing she wanted to discuss before it is your sin <laughs> i have no time it is i have no time that she wants to deal with now <laughs> the, the the 10 minutes you, you didn't want to spend before now, with the complaint and the discussion, you have spent 20 minutes. And uh, you say, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What is it you wanted to say? <laughs> you are not <there. laughs> So, you see, all these things we are saying, these are practical things. Therefore, I will, ahead of time, I will initiate the discussion. And because I initiate it, I can control the time. Are you following? Then... I know that if I am uh, getting away from food, sometimes I do, uh, and I, if I want to do it for one week, I know that I cannot be with a wife and do without food uh, one day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, and not uh, she will be concerned naturally. Because that's what she has learned in the Bible. To care for the husband. To love the husband. To do this and to do that. Therefore, uh, if I know that I'm going to go beyond just uh, one day. Now, when I say go beyond one day, not that I will go for, let's say, seven days now and not eat at all in the, you know, in the middle. Because if I do that, you will be so physically weak. And you cannot preach two times on Monday. You cannot pray three times on Thursday or four times on Sunday. But, like uh, this last Sunday, I told the state tradition, I was discussing with them, all through those four services, I only took warm water. Not that I was fasting, but I've discovered that when I'm like that, I'm stronger. Wait, don't copy me. That, because, you know, that's the temptation. Ah, that's how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Because you see, when a person just copies, and uh, you just copy a person like that, and the Lord is not leading you that way, then you get into a mistake. Uh, are we following? Yeah. Now, uh, when I know that I'm going to this day, I may want to just drink ordinary water, just warm water. 
Anytime I know that, because I know that I must still, you know, go to preach, I must still go to do this, I must still go to do that. I may be waiting upon the Lord, but just take the warm water to keep my system, digestive system clean. And uh, in the evening, I'd be sometimes at 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock, just take a little pack and some vegetables. And then the following day, I may continue like that, the following day continue like that. For a week, I may continue like that. Now, if I know I'm going to do that, uh, this, uh, my wife, knew that even when I wasn't fasting like that before, I had broken down physically. And she knew that, you know, because there was the time after the workers' retreat was so busy and this and that, and when we were going back home, I was, even though that morning I was, you know, really powerful here and talking and everything, or going home, I was so down that if they got into a gallop, it was, you know, so terrible. And all through that Saturday night, we finished the uh, workers' meeting on Saturday that time. It was really bad, vomiting and things like that. And then I woke up on Sunday, and uh, I don't know why it happens like that. But any time I have preaching, I'm all right. <laughs> I, you know, I might have been vomiting and sick and down and everything like that on Saturday night and you know, till 3 a.m., 4 a.m. in the morning, and, you know, and then, I, uh, you know, take some warm water, cleanse everything up, and, you know, wash, and then I wake up, and she'll be asking me, do I go and uh, tell Brother Alfred Joey so that he will, you know, take the meeting, do I go and tell this, do I go and tell that, uh, I will say, wait, I'll tell you, wait, I'll tell you, uh, then we'll wake up at 6 o'clock, and uh, what do we do now? Let's get there, let's see what God can do, and then, um, you know, we get there, I lead <clears throat> the chorus, and then if you cannot come to meet me on the platform and say, you know, who will preach now? And eventually, I get there, I preach, and then when we come back home, and she says, how are you? And I said, you know, I'm all right now. She said, okay, praise the Lord. And we'll continue like that. But you see, uh, if you are waiting on the Lord, and you don't even discuss at all, because she knew that I had broken down before like that, she would not want me to break down again. So, uh, before I ever get into, you know, that thing, I would, uh, you know, talk to her, not preaching, not opening the Bible. So I just say that, uh, you know, I wonder for this uh, Moses in the Bible, that 40, 40, 40 days, just did not taste anything that, uh, you know, and I'm a minister, and I will never dream of these 40 days, but even if it's only three days. <laughs> and, um, oh, she, and then, you see, when you mention 40 days like that for Moses, and it's a human being, and you are talking of three days, you know, just for yourself, she will not worry. She will not be afraid. And it doesn't take us five minutes, ten minutes. And then, uh, you know, if sometimes she's the one reminding me, saying that uh, you said you are not, you know, going to stay on foot today. And uh, sometimes when I'm waiting on the Lord like that, she'll be, remem she'll be reminding me that, uh, well, since today is special to you, uh, I'll, you know, keep the children downstairs. I would, uh, you know, do this, I'll do this. Then uh, you want to go out again. I was praying because it's fasting and praying that the Bible says she is the person that will be gingering me helping me and pushing me ahead because I had discussed with her. If I didn't discuss with her, she would, on the other hand, be concerned. Are you following what I'm saying? So you see, uh, as we look into all these things, now, uh, even though I've not read chapter such, verse such, I've been referring to the Bible. Do you understand? Uh, and uh, as I told you, I didn't intend to, you know, go in this direction. But since you are pastors, and what God is doing with one man, he can do with you. That's why I've uh, allowed myself to open up and to get into all these details. But whatever the Lord is doing in your life, whatever breakthrough you are having in your life, make sure that the church work does not suffer, your family does not suffer, everything is still all right, so that you don't get into a position where... Uh, other people are beginning to, you know, note that, uh, uh, what is this? What is happening to you? And don't ever, if you are going to fast, don't fast 
I said if because it's not everybody. I've not seen where Elisha fasted to get the double portion of the spirit. Elijah did. When God said, uh, when the angel said, go in the, in the strength of this food, he went in the strength of that food and he went 40 days in that strength. But uh, Elisha, on the other hand, that received the double portion, you would have thought that man, he will fast until he becomes a skeleton. But not at all. Not at all. Because God deals with different people in different ways. You will know how God is dealing with you. Because my sheep hear my voice. And they follow me. A stranger's voice, they will not follow. And it's a stranger's voice when uh, I finish my message now. And you just say, I'm going to add this in. What is today? Today is uh, July, July 15. Okay, between now and July 15, I calculate 40 days. I can try. I can do it. And then you go back. All that you say, all I want to eat, I will eat there today. And you have three bowls of food. <laughs> because you are preparing for 40 days. And you eat and you eat until you have constipation. <laughs> and then tomorrow, you say, God, ready, set. <laughs> I was 40 days it will not miss. And then at 1.30 you are so hungry. You say, what will I do? I will, I will start it again tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> then, you, then you go and eat. And after you go and eat, you have condemnation. And why are you having condemnation? God didn't tell you to do it. You are not disobeying God. There is nothing you have done to offend God. And you are having condemnation because you have eaten. And this is not God's problem at all. It is your problem that you impose upon yourself. It is a law that you make and a law that you can break. <laughs> so, uh, don't let us get into any mechanical thing. And uh, as I have opened my heart to you, the Lord will help every one of us in Jesus' name. Now let's look at John chapter 15. From verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. And I'm believing God, you, you will bear more fruit. Yeah. The hand of the Lord will purge every one of us. Yeah. And any little thing that may not even be significant to people or to us, that God knows will hinder our fruit bearing, he will so purge us since we have given him the permission. We have said, Oh Lord, here am I. Anything that is a hindrance to growth, anything that is a hindrance to power, purge it out of my life, and God will take everything away, that we may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean, through the word which I have spoken unto you, abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. You see how simple it is? I abide in him, as God indwelt, and he abides in me. The same person will bear much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Luke chapter 1, from verse 34. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be seen? I know not the man. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing that shall, that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of, the, the Son of God. Verse 37, For with God nothing shall be impossible. Verse 45, Blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. You are blessed for believing. All through from Wednesday till this morning, we have been sharing with you the mind of God, the possibilities of growth, the power for growth. And when we have talked about all these things, you heard, you received, you believed. 
Blessed are you because you have believed there shall be a performance of those things which were told you from the Lord. Let's rise up and pray. Open your heart to God. Tell the Lord about your life. Tell the Lord you believe. You believe. All things are possible. What you have seen here, God can repeat it in your own location where you are. He can do it. He will do it. Just believe God. Depend on the Lord. Depend on the Lord. Remember that the whole church has prayed for you, both on Sunday and on Monday. And we have prayed already for you. It will be so. Jesus name we pray. Amen. 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 We have come during this period before the presence of the Almighty God. I will believe that the Lord has started something new in our lives. Amen. On Sunday while we are at the Magada Church. All the members prayed for us with all their hearts. Yesterday, while we were there again, they prayed for us with all their hearts. I want us to believe that that which they have asked God on our behalf, that there's going to be a performance of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Believe it, that as the saints have prayed, realizing what God's word has said, that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man has led much. And thousands of people have lifted up their voices on the throne of grace on your behalf. Believe that there will be a performance of what the Lord has, what they've asked from the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Believe that that prayer has been made for you in particular. And as we go out, let's go out in faith that God is going to do what he says I've asked for you. Our Father, we thank you because of your loving dealing with us. We bless you because of the relationship we have with you. And we thank you because you are building up that relationship so that we can be our best for you and we can enjoy you more and more. This morning again, you have opened your heart to us. We feel your presence. We feel your joy. And again, we have a reassurance within us that we are going to have a breakthrough. This is a special time in our lives. We have come for a special seminar. To prepare us for special task ahead. Oh Lord God. All through these times. We personally prayed. Your saints have prayed for us. 
And more than that, your servant, our general superintendent, he has already also prayed for us. And we know, Lord, that there's going to be a performance. Amen. So let it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Any form of unbelief, we ask that we clear it off from our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. This is our chance. Elijah is no more. Elijah is no more. Paul is no more. Joshua is not here again. Moses is not here again. This is our own chance. We have seen the example of how you are using our leader. And he has told us too that you can do the same thing with us. We believe, oh God. Do the same thing with us in Jesus' name. Is that bearing fruit, you purge it so that we can bear forth more fruit. Purge us so that we can bear forth more fruits in Jesus' name. Amen. Our desire is that as we are living here, we are living here with the power of God upon our lives, Amen. with the Spirit of God upon us, Amen. to have a continuous breakthrough. So let it be in Jesus' name. Amen. In our families, in our congregation, in our locations, let them see the mark of success, the power of success, Amen. the spirit of success, Amen. the fruit of success Amen. in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. All you have shared with us out of your abundant wisdom, give us the grace to apply our own hearts unto wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Let every one of us behave as mature adults. Amen. All these precious things we put into our bosoms. Let us not cast them away or play with them. Or just do as swines who will trample on precious pears. But all these things, let us guide them. Watch over them jealously in our hearts. Just like Mary, when he had those precious things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, he hid them in her heart. Our Father, all these things you have told us, let us hide them in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. We are living at a special time. We are in a special church. We are a special brand of people. And we are sure you have a special assignment for us. And we know we are going to have a special success. Amen. So let it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father, we are sure of your love. Amen. We are told yesterday, just as you loved your son, Jesus Christ, the same way you have loved us. Just as you sent him to the world, the same way you have sent us. The same success he had. Give it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. The disciples, the apostles, they had the same success. Oh Lord God, grant every one of us the same success in Jesus' name. Amen. In the different locations, in the local government areas, in all the states, let there be great success in Jesus' name. Amen. You have spoken to us. We have heard you. We have received your word. We have believed your word. More than that, we have believed your prophet. And we know that we are going to prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't we don't doubt anything. We receive everything for ourselves. And we believe that as we live here, we are going to do exploits for your own glory in Jesus' name. Amen. On whatever, backward never in Jesus' name. Amen. Every day of our life will be days of progress, will be days of success, will be days of victory, will be days of prosperity Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father, we are going to make the best use of this time. We relieve ourselves in your own hands. Deal with us as your precious children. All that needs to be done in our lives. Do it, Lord. And let us achieve your own goals. Achieve your own victory. Achieve your own fruits. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our God. We rejoice before you. Because we know that we are having a living one. The world which is present in our affairs. That measure of success you've designed for our lives. 
Let us not have anything lower than it in Jesus' name. Amen. From now onwards, let there be an explosion in every area of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. All our workers, let them enjoy us more than before in Jesus' name. Amen. All our congregation, let them enjoy us more than ever before in Jesus' name. Amen. Even in our families, let them enjoy us more than ever before in Jesus' name. Amen. And more than ever before, let us enjoy God, enjoy His work, enjoy His service more than ever before in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going on, we are going for victory. We are going, we are going for results. We are going, we are going for your borders. We are going, we are going, Lord, for your harvest. So let it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Goodness, mercy, grace, victory, prosperity, power, anointing, glory, fullness will go with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God, when we come back again, we are, come back with, we are coming back with testimonies. Amen. So let it be in Jesus' name. Amen. That which we have put within our bosom, the grace and the wisdom and the maturity to maintain it, to keep it all, all through. Give it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God, we have prayed much and others have prayed for us. We didn't have too much time to pray for our pastor, the general superintendent. But again, as your children, in all humility, we still bring him before you, O oh God. You have made him our leader. The only leader we have. Yes. One fold, one shepherd. Yes. And right now, he's our shepherd in this church. Under you, the great shepherd. And ask all the pastors in unity of faith to bring him before your throne. We are asking, O oh God, that your hands and your power, Amen. your grace and your anointing, Amen. your wisdom Amen. and your fullness Amen. will come upon him Amen. more than ever before in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. All he needs to minister to us, all he needs to fulfill his, your calling upon his life for this time and for this generation, supply it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God. You see, you know it helps us when we see a model. More than ever before, make him a greater model in Jesus' name. Amen. In every area, Lord, make him a model in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, we want to see a pattern we'll be looking at. Paul says, be followers of me as I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's our Paul for today. More than ever before, equip him. Feel him. Energize him. And do greater things through him in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't want him for this church alone. We want him for the whole of this nation. We want him for the whole of this continent. We want him for the whole of this generation. Amen. So let it be in Jesus' name. Amen. That is our desire. Amen. We are not selfish. Not for us alone. We know that as you magnify him. And you use him more. We are going to enjoy him more. Amen. So let it be in Jesus' name. Amen. By your spirit, by your power, by your enablement, magnify him in Jesus' name. Amen. You told Joshua that we magnify him before the people. Amen. We are asking you that we magnify him before this generation in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, it will be our pride, it will be our joy. And the more you give to him, the more we are going to receive. Amen. Give him more, oh Lord, not for deeper life alone, not for deeper life alone, but for the whole of this generation. So let it be in Jesus' name. Amen. All of us as pastors, we agree on it. We tell you, Lord, with our little faith, with all our collective faith, we agree and we accept it and we receive it on his behalf in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you for everything. Our God, we don't know the extent to which you are leading us. But we bow before you. We submit to you. We leave all in your hands. Lead on, O oh God. And we keep following you in Jesus' name. Amen. Wherever we lead, we will follow. Thank you for everything. Our God, we have promised to serve you to the end. You are our master. You are our friend. We will ever stick close to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for everything. As we go back, we just ask you that your protection, your power, 
will build upon every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen.